Hi, everybody. My name is Angie Larson. If we haven't had the chance to meet yet, I get to serve as the executive pastor here at Calvary, and it's my honor to be with you all today. It is also my honor to introduce our next speaker, who's going to come up here in just a second. His position officially is Director of Elementary Strategy at Orange, and so he does a lot of work with kids and students and preparing us to be able to teach those kids and students in our context. Um, He's from Atlanta, Georgia, flew in here yesterday. Um, I've recently learned about him that he's a kind of guy that has a playlist for every occasion. He has a playlist for mowing the lawn. He's got a playlist for renting a muscle car from the airport. He's got a playlist for every single thing that he can do. Um, He's also the kind of guy that is the only person that I know personally that can rock the kind of haircut that that he has. I don't know anybody else that can pull that off. I know, it's a good looking haircut. I mean, Hans Dahl can definitely not pull that off. So, but uh, his biggest accomplishment is that he's the father of four kids. And so if he looks tired, you got to just offer him some empathy. Uh, I'm the mom of four kids, so I have deep empathy for you there. Um, But we're proud of that. And let's welcome up with a big round of applause, Dan Scott. Thank you, thank you. Well, hey, friends. It is so good to be here. The last time I was here was in... October of 2019, right before the world shut down. That, that was great. Um, but it is honestly a really uh, kind of, yeah, there we go. Um, it's really good to be back out in and among the people and the world, isn't it? Like, I, that was really hard, that, all that stuff that, that we went through. And what I have found as I've been traveling to different churches and traveling through airports and trying not to talk to people, but talking to people because they talk to you on airplanes. I'm more of like the, just put my headphones in and, you know, just, yeah. But they talk to you. Everyone has a COVID story. Every single person that you meet has a COVID story. And no other time in history, really, have we had a global experience that we have all experienced the same thing at the same time. And we've experienced it in different ways, but we've all experienced this thing called COVID. In March of 2020, I, was, I flew with my son to New Jersey to celebrate my grandmother. And we're sitting at table. My cousin, who's a pediatric oncologist, he's like, you are lucky you got a flight. The world's about to change. You're not going to be going anywhere anytime soon. And I'm like, what are you what are you joking? Like, no, he's like, no, this COVID thing, <laughs> it's legit. And I was like, sure enough, he was right. I wasn't on another plane for 20 months. And, and that next weekend, our orange offices, they shut down. We got upgraded our Zoom accounts. And we started putting all of our material online so churches and families could continue faith formation in the home. And I I share a little bit about my COVID story because you have a COVID story. The families in your churches have a COVID story. And what's so important is that uh, something I've learned, I was a a theater major uh, back in college. Mom and dad loved that, by the way. That was really good for them. Um, One of the things though I learned is that your collective audience is smarter than you. It means like when you get up on stage or when you're doing some sort of improv game, you have to be very aware that collectively your audience is smarter than you. So you need to make wise choices about what you do, wise choices about what you say. And as a church, you need to understand that there are a lot of families in your community and collectively they have more experience and understand more about their world than you do. And so we need to start listening to our families and listening to our audiences. And who is our audience? Well, it's a family. Now, this family can look like anything. These families are diverse, and you have a lot of them. These are families that are connected to your church. These are families who know about your church. These are, these are families who would rather not know about your church. These are families who just drive by your church and kind of know that it's like over there on you know, First Street or whatever. And all of these families have a story to tell. 
The truth is, though, when we study families, if you go to conferences and learn things, often we study families so we can speak to them. But please don't study your audience just to speak to them. If we're just doing that, we're no better than a marketing firm. Instead, we need to listen to your audience, listen to your family so we can learn from them. Because after all, we are not just doing this out on our own. Our job is to partner with families. They should be in the driver's seat and we should be listening to them. What do they need and how can we help? So let's find out a little bit about what's happening with families. Han said at the beginning, this is going to be a little, a little depressing in some places. This might be one of those like depressing moments. I just, just throwing that out there. One in six kids, ages two through eight, is experiencing a mental or behavioral disorder. Mental health concerns have risen greatly with the collective trauma that kids have experienced the past three years. Divorce inquiries, people who are going to a lawyer to discuss what it would look like to be divorced, up 136% over 2019. That doesn't mean that they're ending, but people are considering it, right? One in eight adults with children experience food insecurity, meaning that there is at least one day a week where they do not know where their meals are coming from. They do not have enough food in the pantry to feed their family that day, that evening. One in five renters with children are not caught up on rent that was forgiven during the time of COVID. And all of a sudden, it was, it, now they have to, you know. And so your, your homeless populations are growing in your different communities. Medicaid enrollees increased by almost 25% from February 2020 to May 2022. People who lost their jobs, lost their insurance. And then students in 2022 are still facing learning deficits from the school that they missed in 2020. I've seen this in my own home. My daughter, she's a junior, and she's like, um, I didn't learn that. Like she was supposed to learn it in eighth grade when she, you know, when the world shut down. But our school district did this whole, uh, you know, if, if you like your grade, don't worry about studying. No harm, no foul. There was harm. <laughs> because kids are having to play catch up for what they learned. And so we look at these statistics and we can get so depressed and we're like, oh my word, what are we going to do? Like, it's so bad out there. But it's not all bad. It's, it's really not all bad. And that's what gives us hope. Oh, families still want to be better families. Parents still want to be better parents. Humans still want to be better humans. I mean, the truth is, 60% of parents say that parenting is an extremely important part of their identity, and they want to work on it. They want to be better parents, because it is how they see themselves operating in the world. If you search, I want to be a better parent, you will find 265 million videos on YouTube about what it means to be a better parent. The self-help industry is valued at $43.77 billion. People want to be better at what they do. And as those numbers are decreasing in the church, we cannot forget that we actually still have people coming to our church. 70 to 75% of people have returned to church post-COVID. So what are we doing to help those 70 to 75% of people who have come back to do the mission of the church in our communities? It's questions that we need to ask, but the truth is life is complicated. And if anything, COVID exposed just how complicated it was. Because many families haven't returned back to church because they realized, oh my word, I get to breathe on Sunday mornings. They haven't 
put their kids back in sports because they realize, oh my word, our life is just so much. Whew, we, can, we have margin now. And they like having that margin. But one of the things that the pandemic exposed was exposed that the church wasn't preparing parents to own their kids' faith formation like we thought they were. Orange, ministry where I work, um, if you are unfamiliar with that, our goal is to resource churches to help parents lead their kids in faith. We believe that the heart of the, the family, Red, partners with the light of the church, Yellow, and when those two things get together, you have Orange. And we thought we were doing this, and we thought we were doing this really, 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 really well. But what we found when the world shut down, and parents were now truly in the driver's seat, that the church has maybe had one hand on the wheel the whole time. And parents were all of a sudden like, whoa, 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 I don't know what to do now. I don't know how to have these conversations. I don't know how to navigate all of this. And now we're trying to figure out how do we help, how do we really help churches resource parents? How do we talk directly to parents to do the work of faith formation? On top of that, the past three years have been some of the hardest on the cultural perception of the church. Hans talked a little bit about this with response to COVID, with opening things back up, response to politics, left and right and middle, and what does it all mean anymore? And the cultural perception of the church is that the church is broken. But here's the thing. We get to change that perception. See, we're not going to change Big C Church and in some cases, I would even say maybe that Big C Church doesn't exist anymore. That there is no longer one church. There are churches. There are denominations literally working on splits as we speak. Nope, we're not part of that, them anymore. We're making our own thing. So we can do this and we can do that. But what you get to do is change the perception of your local church. The local church is the heartbeat of the future of this faith. Because you get to know people and talk to them and speak with them and see them week in and week out, day in and day out. And that is what's going to change the world. So Orange decided to ask, what would it look like to finally listen and learn from parents in our communities? Not assume we know what they need, not assume we know what they want, but actually go and talk to them. And not just parents inside the church, but parents outside the church. So uh, for the past three years, we did a study. There's a book, uh, What Parents, What well, Most Parents Aren't Telling You. Uh, it is all of the research that we did in partnership with uh, Arbor Research Firm. Uh, they are experts in the field of research. And what we did was we polled about 1,500 parents uh, in the general population who do not consider themselves part of any sort of faith background whatsoever. They were diverse in their experience. They were single parents. They were LGBTQ parents, like just different parents um, across the spectrum. And then we did poll about 1,300 uh, parents who self-selected that they were committed Christian parents. And all that that meant was that they were connected to a local church that they attended at least once a month. So really low bar on what we meant by committed Christian parents, but the bar's really low right now anyway. And I think we're all experiencing that. But they self-selected this. And so here's some of the, the data. What do parents want? So we said... Out of these 17 things, access to resources, healthy mentors, mental health, character development, faith development, we said, can you tell us if this doesn't matter to you or if it's extremely important to you? It was really interesting to get this research back and see that all of them, 65% of all parents, marked everything but faith development 
as most important, as important to extremely important in the life of their kids. That's all parents. That's the only thing that they disagreed on between the committed Christian parents and the general population parents, which makes sense. When you looked at what parents want most, their top three priorities, all parents in the general population, mental health, access to opportunities, and character development. Now think about it. What do you think might be different with Christian, committed Christian parents? Just think maybe in your head about what you think that might look like. Got it? It's exactly the same. Every parent wants their kid to be healthy, successful, and good. Every parent. Faith development was maybe in the top five here, but it was not the number one priority for families, for parents. Now, you can lament that, or you can say, this is an opportunity. All the parents that I will ever come into contact with in a driving area of my local church cares about the same exact things for their kids. I now have a starting point for everyone to get on the same page in our community. The problem is we also pulled where parents go for help. And the church is really not one of those places. So top five, all parents, spouse, partner, extended family. This means that this is where they primarily go for help, the top section. The bottom section is things that they've consulted, and they're pretty much the same. For your Christian parents, the only difference is that they did see, they did rate church as one of the primary places or a place that they have consulted in the past uh, for help when it comes to how do I promote those values in my family. So it's three for them. Uh, If you look at the research though, church, it's really low. This is saying 19% of all parents consider it um, that the majority of, wait, let me just check the color. Sorry, the color is weird for me. 19.1%, they've consulted the church. Only 6% consider it the most important place where I can go for help. And for parents in the general population, church ranked the least helpful of all 17 options. Like I said, the cultural perception of the church is that the church is broken. But you get to change that perception by how you listen to and connect with parents in your community. You get to change that. And the bar's really low. (laughs) So any step towards parents is going to feel and seem like a very big deal. And it isn't all bad, right? Like, it's not all bad. There are 22% of all parents who do find the church at least extremely helpful institutions in general. But most of the people that are filling out these surveys, they have a specific church in mind that was not helpful. They have a specific church in mind that they don't trust anymore. But those, those Christian parents, they're willing to listen and they're willing to see to have you help them. 88% of them think it's an extremely helpful institution. But the truth is, for whatever reason, someone's decided to leave church, and a lot of people have left church, as we know. It's not one thing. It's a series of things. It's either, it's like both and. Like, it could be, well, the, uh, all the controversy about this and all the Christian nationalism, that, and all, you know, the, they hate my friends. Like, this is my family, right? Like, if I pulled my own children who do not want to go to church, it's because, well, the church doesn't love my, my friends. <laughs> the church doesn't care about my mental health. The church doesn't do this or that. And 
I'm a professional Christian. <laughs> like, this is my job. And I'm looking at my children, and I'm like, whoa, we have it all. We have it so wrong. We have it so broken. If that's what you think church is. But what, the, what can the church even do about it? Is, is it? is it too late? I don't, I don't think so. I think we have a crucial time frame right now. And the first thing that we have to do is we have to acknowledge that the world has changed. We need to stop complaining about it. We can't let it make us bitter. We actually have to sit in it. I'm an Enneagram 7. I don't like sitting in my emotions, especially the negative ones. I want to run away from them and escape them. But the truth is, what, what my therapists have told me is you need to sit in your emotions and you need to grieve what is so you can accept what is in order to move forward. I think that's what this morning is so, why it's so important for us is to say, yep, the world has changed and it sucks. It's so, I hate it so much. And I'm going to be sad about it and I'm going to be angry about it. But at the end of the day, I have to accept it that it's not going back to 2019. It's not going back to the heyday that it once was when Pastor Johnson was the pastor. <laughs> it's not. But it could be something. And until we grieve it and accept it, we can't move past it. And when we decide to move past it, as we start to engage families, we have to engage with humility and curiosity. Because let's be honest, when I was in seminary, they didn't teach a course on how to navigate pandemics. That class didn't exist. I bet it does now, but it didn't at the time. And we are all making this up as we go along. Do not feel like you don't have it all together. No one has it all together right now. We're all trying to figure it out. And so we have to figure it out with humility and curiosity. We need to ask questions and we need to engage families and not say, hey, here's how it's going to be for the next two years. No. What do you all need? What do you need from us? What are questions do you have? What questions are your kids asking? Why, are they, why don't they want to come to youth group? And we can't get defensive about the answers that we hear. We have to acknowledge them and accept them and say, okay, if that's their perception, how do I change that perception and take action to move forward? Because what we do means we have to meet families in the present by offering hope for the future. The empathy of sitting with a family and saying, I know it sucks right now. I know it is so bad. Yeah. But there's hope. There's going to be another side. There's going to be the other side. And we get to do that together. So the truth is, we, one thing that we know is that every parent cares about their kid's future. The data tells us this. And what the data also tells us is that every church cares about kids' futures. Every, every kid in your community, you care about their future. It's just that parents don't know that. Parents think you don't care about their kids' future. So how can you rethink what you do in order to help y'all get on the same page? Because at the end of the day, this future, it's unwritten. But just imagine what it would look like if you partnered with parents and wrote that future together. But the only way that happens is if you meet parents in a posture of humility and curiosity. You don't come with this five-step plan that won't work anyway. Just say, what do you need? How can we help? That's going to speak volumes to parents 
who are rapidly Googling and YouTubing and trying to figure out, what do I do now? But why don't we all figure it out together? Thank you. I really love what Dan said. Uh, None of us have it all together, right? I didn't even know how to turn my microphone on there for a moment, right? So here's what we want to do. After each session, again, we're going to take some time to have some conversation around your table. So pull out that action plan sheet. We're going to take some notes. But here are the questions we want to wonder about. And then I'm going to invite Dan to come back up, and we're actually going to do a little Q&A. Sound good? Thumbs up? Let's do it. We're going to uh, move into kind of a Q&A time, and I ask you all to uh, 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 spend some time uh, talking about Dan's talk. How about another round of applause for Dan, everybody? Thank you. And here, here's the great truth about Dan. I actually met Dan in a bar in Atlanta. Yep. That's how we That's met. Correct. And we're not going to tell you any of the rest of the no. story. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but uh, absolutely love Dan. I love his, his uh, vulnerability, um, his heart, his passion, uh, of course, for kids, but for the church. Um, Dan, as I was listening to what you had to say, um, one of the things I think all of us wrestle with as church leaders is the part in your talk where you talked about accepting and grieving, yeah. right? I think all of the people who are here recognize the changes that are happening in culture as related to the church. But we get stuck as churches because that acceptance of how the world has shifted, um, we get stuck there. uh, And so we never get to the point of grieving. So from your perspective, you get this 40,000 foot view of all these churches. Are there any examples of churches that have done that well? Have, be, have accepted where they're at and, and yeah. moved forward. And actually, I mean, I think that grieving part is really important too. Like we don't want to just say, okay, we accept it, we move on. There's this healthy way no, of moving yeah, through for it. for sure. I, I do think that we need to sit in the disappointment. Mm-hmm. And we need to sit in the, uh, I mean, when we were here in 2019 and you were building this facility yep. and you had all these goals and you had all these plans and you had all this momentum going and then all of a sudden the momentum stops yeah. yep. and you have, you're now are like, you're, you're rebuilding from a deficit, not just from where you left off. Right. Uh, and, and the, the acceptance of, oh man, like, yeah, this is just, re- this is not what we planned. Like, mm-hmm. this is not the life we had in mind for our church. Right. When I started coming, when I came on staff, when I took the call to be an elder, when I did, this is where we were headed, and now that will never happen. Mm-hmm. Yet, because that's why we started, we're, we're continuing trying to grasp at that. And we're trying to keep our, well, if we just, maybe if we just put a little bit more money behind it, if maybe if we just put a little bit more effort behind it, maybe if we just get a little bit more volunteers, that will really come again. And I, I think that what we have to do is we just have to take that whole thing off the table and say, yep, that's what we wanted. That's not what we're going to have. And we're just going to have to drop it. I think, I, I will be honest, I don't think that there is a church that I would, like that immediately comes to mind. Hmm. That's, that's like, oh yeah, they totally... Because some of the big, even the bigger churches have literally just returned to, this is, now we just do it with fewer people, but this right. is what we're, we've always done. It we seems like that's a default. Now. We're just going back to the Yeah, because it was easy. Way. It was easy. And, and I know like at the beginning of the pandemic, all of us were like, hey, so you've never had a season in your church where no one was showing up for seven weeks? So use these seven weeks to like make some changes, do some things, because now no one's going to have any expectation of what it looks like when we come back mm-hmm. and you can like rip band-aids off. Okay, well, you, well that time's over. So, so now we're trying to make change while people are coming back and, and it's, just, it's just really difficult. Yeah. But That's not a helpful answer. No, I know, and I feel really <laughs> bad. No, I feel really bad. Yeah. I, I do think that there are churches who are saying... Yeah. I, 
it has to, something has to change and they are trying new things, whether they're trying a new digital strategy, whether they're bringing parents together and are having conversations with them. Mm -hmm. They are trying to still figure out, they're trying hybrid models of some sort. They are realizing that the world has changed. I just don't think any, because we're all really grasping at straws. Like yeah. I said, like it's we're new. all, everything is, is navigating it new and depending on your community, yeah. it's going to be different. Yeah. You know, if you're in Chicagoland, if you're in, you know, Alexandria, yep. Minnesota, it's going to look different. Which takes me to something else you said, that, that idea about listening to learn, yeah. right? Listening to learn. And, um, you know, that the, the part of your presentation where you talked about having humility and curiosity, yeah. um, just getting really practical, what does that look like? Because I think, well, I'll just say, what does that look like? I mean, <laughs> can you give examples of that? Yeah. What does it look like for a congregation to say, hey, rather than listening in order to you know, shout at parents. How do we listen to learn? Yeah, uh, part of it is is the posture. I think anytime, a, lo a lot of times when you gather parents, and I did this, you know, as a as a family pastor, as a children's pastor, you'd gather parents, you'd gather a focus group, but it's really to try to like prove that what you already have in mind is best for them. <laughs> You're right. Yeah. Uh, and I I think we have to let go of the agenda in the conversation and ask more questions than give answers mm -hmm. uh, and prepare them ahead of time that that's what you're doing. Uh, I the word curiosity for me in the past six months has just been massive, right? Uh, and I, I've talked a little bit about like just sitting in the seat of curiosity mm -hmm. because so much of it right now is unknown and we all have an experience that's slightly different from someone else's experience through this time. I mean, even if you get COVID, you get COVID differently than your neighbor got COVID. Mm -hmm. Like it's also nuanced right now yeah. in culture, mm -hmm. but we're speaking in generalities and the church is great at speaking in generalities mm -hmm. that we need to get back to the nuance of, of what it means to have an actual listening, active listening conversation with literally no agenda in mind, just to say, hey, we're just exploring what life is like right now for you as families in our community. And you don't go to the families that you always go to. You go to the families of those families. Like, you go to the friends of those friends. You go to the, you know, and you, and you show up and you just start. Yeah. 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 I mean, for you, it's like, you're sitting at Zorba's and you're, you know, hey, I've been there. What's once going on right now? Yeah. You know, they just, they don't know your name at right. all there uh, and your drink order. Right. <laughs> so uh, here, here's what I think we often do. So you talked about mental health, uh, access to opportunity, character development, right? Yeah. You talked about those being the big three that whether you uh, are from a Christian background, not Christian background, you you are looking for and i think and interestingly enough the church typically doesn't do very well with mental health yeah that's that could be next year's conference yeah yeah i mean typically it's yeah have more faith right you know, shove right. that under the rug yeah here's what i think though uh i think we have the tendency as the church to say well then we got to start one more program so we're going to start a program here. We're going to start a program. No, and I don't that, think it's that. that. I don't think it's, it's that. I, I but think... I don't think it's working, right? I don't think that mentality no, yeah, of just yeah, starting yeah. one more program. No, for sure. Like Why? you're not going to all of a sudden having a have a counseling like, like right, like a counseling network at your church like that. That's not what they that this means. But I think that's my fear is that people will listen and they'll say, okay, we got to start a mental health program. No, We've got to access no, no, no. to opportunity. In fact, if you are in Minnesota, by the way. Uh, you have top five mental health care in the country. Mm -hmm. um, it, it is, it is yeah. number five of 50, um, of the 50 states. And so you already have great care in your communities. A lot of it is we don't know the stories because of the stigma of mental health in the church, yeah. right? So for lead pastors to do a, a series on emotions, to do a series on mental health, just to kind of diffuse the, the tension mm -hmm. and say, hey, this is a part of our lives. This is a, whether you're a follower of Jesus or Normalize not, like you, you, we are humans and humans mm -hmm. struggle with these things. 
I think that's part of it. I think it's when you gather your students together, you acknowledge the fact that there are that these things are real and they exist and they are not a sin and they are. I saw on Twitter someone tweeted that ADHD is a sin and I was like, well, crap, like I'm screwed, right? right. Like, um, and, right. and so, but it's like one of those things where you're like, but if that's the perception of yep. the church, right, then you have to change that perception and it has to be done at your church on a global level. It can't be just be the way that you talk to students and kids. It, and actually in preschool, we just did a whole series on emotions, mm. which was re- like, we all feel big emotions. Yeah. Like we all feel big feels. And, and, but adults need to hear that yeah. as well and to be let off the hook. Mm-hmm. Access to opportunities is probably the hardest one for the church, I think, mm-hmm. because we also don't have access to opportunities. Yep. But I think it's realizing that these are things that parents care about. So what would it look like and this, this might be where it's an extra thing, but what would it be for the church to partner with the local elementary school, the local high school, and say, hey, we want to do a career fair. We would love to support you in, in any chance, you know, any possibility. Like, use the community aspects at, that you have at your disposal because, by and large, a family will go to the YMCA before they'll come to your church. Right? So go to the YMCA and say, hey, we're Calvary Lutheran, and we are in your community. Maybe you drove past us one time. Right. And we would love to just help you sponsor this. And then from a character development standpoint, um, well, if you use Orange Curriculum, hint, hint, yeah. uh, we do that from Which, a, by the way. We do that uh, from a biblical perspective. Partners have every single, access every to single month. Orange Curriculum. Um, yep. We highlight... A, a virtue, a character development that is either a response or a reflection of the character of God, that God is doing something in us to change the world around us, and we want every kid to, in elementary school, as they're discovering who they are, that they can also see that God is using them to do something in the world. I think one of the reasons I'm pushing you on this is that I think often our response in the church when we hear, okay, we've got to do something about mental health or we've got to do something about food insecurity, we say, we're going to start a program. So we get a handful of volunteers kind of off in the corner and they're working on it. And what I hear you saying is, no, 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 no. These things should be mainstream. Oh, yeah, 100%. Like within the context of the life of the church, and this is how you change the perception. Uh, I, have, I have a friend, uh, his name is Josh, and he has a church in Nashville, and they go to Pride Parade every single June, mm-hmm. right? Like their church has a float in Pride Parade. Mm-hmm. So they are saying, we are part of this community, we love the people in Nashville, and we are going to literally be here and do it. It's not something extra. There are people in their church. That's what they care about. And so they organize it. There's and that side group that goes make it, And they make it happen uh, every year. And, and I love that about, uh, uh, about this church, that, that, that that's what they do. And that's what they've decided where they've decided to be. They, you know, um, for your church, you have to realize, like, what is around you? And how can I partner with what already exists in my community to just give them a breath of fresh air and give them like some encouragement. Like, hey, so we found some things out about parents. They really, they turn to you for some things. How can we help you meet the parents you're already meeting? Uh, that's that sort that. of thing. Yeah. I love it. Thank you. All right, you all have some questions I'm sure you want to ask. And there's someone roving with we a- We really only have two minutes though? Just ignore that. I okay. do on Sunday. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so- Who's got the microphone? Who's got que- Raise your hand if you've got a question here for my buddy, Dan. I mean, I may not have an answer, so I'm just going to qualify that. There we go. I'll try. Hi. Hi. Um, okay, so our question is this. We're sitting with um, a bunch of our next-gen ministry people, and um, we feel like our parents sort of have a... Um, oh. Um, have a drop off and now we need to take a break mentality. Yep. Like, okay. And they do. Yes. Yep. Um, and real after COVID, right? They have yeah. been with their kids for yeah. lots and lots of time. Um, but so we were just but, wondering if yeah. there were any suggestions or thoughts that you had about how to um, meet the parents and engage, engage the parents in a way that fills them up rather than feels like another thing I'm Burden. supposed to do. That's, That's great. Question. So are you talking about 
a wet, like a Wednesday program where they're dropped off and they leave, or just on Sunday mornings that they uh, drop? Both. Pretty much anything. I mean, we have both Sunday mornings and Wednesday evenings, but yeah. I think we would say maybe more so on the Wednesday evenings. Okay. I think yeah. Heather, Heather's from our church. She's excellent, by the way. She is just, we're really gifted to have Heather on our team. No, that's good. Um, I think she's, I think regardless of when the time is, I think the question is, how do we engage those parents in the sorts yeah. of meaningful experiences yeah, absolutely. that help empower them to For be sure. the faith formative? Well, I think part of it, and Dave is going to talk probably more about this, you do have to go to where parents already are uh, because so they don't feel like it's one more thing. I mean, that is why Orange has the Parent Q app. Mm -hmm. So there are a, lots of resources that you have, like, literally at, at your disposal. I think utilizing your social media platforms for more than just broadcasting, but for engagement and conversation, I think is really helpful um, that, that you realize that a parent may not sit somewhere for 45 minutes because they realize they have, but, but I sit in car rider line for 45 minutes literally every day. Mm -hmm. And so what am I doing to help that parent make the most of the 45 minutes that they have by themselves in the car literally every single day. Now, they're not going to watch a YouTube video from your church every single day, but they may if you, if you have a book that you recommend and you want all parents to go through and you discount it and you try to get it at a bulk rate or that they could read during that time, or you, you, know, you have a, a Slack channel that is on their phone and the Slack channel or the Facebook group or the thing... Like, where are the parents already, and how can you use those to engage in conversations where most of parenting is waiting? Um, mm -hmm. You know, so much mm -hmm. of parenting is waiting. And so how do you leverage the time that they're just literally sitting in the car listening to music or a podcast? Like, what is the podcast that you're recommending? And it could be that you've, that, that the church, that your church isn't creating the content, but is curating the content, mm -hmm. and you are creating playlists that you say, hey, there's a playlist on Spotify of, of three podcasts we would love for you to listen to this week on parenting. Go to them, um, listen to them at your disposal. There's going to be some questions in a Facebook group if you want to engage. If not, you don't have to engage, but we just want to help you become better parents and we want to resource you. And, you know, you take a month and if, if, if the month is Mental Awareness yeah, Month, that's really good. every podcast that you give to parents is how to help your kids navigate mental health, right? Or you, that sort of thing. So um, it's it's... Flipping the, like, the content is out there. It's in spades. It's curating it so you're giving your parents the, the voice that you think, you know, is important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your question, Heather. That's really good. I mean, All Dave right. might come up I and, had like, another one. tell me Back here. Not. I have more of a comment than I do a question. Here. So years ago, we had a pastor come into our home and met with us, talked about our church. Uh, it, it cemented our relationship with that church like no other way it could have. We talk about meeting people where they are, and yet we wait for these people to come in to us. I love it. Yeah. No, that's really important. Um, a few years ago, I think it was right before the world shut down, Reggie talked about everything changes when it's someone you know. Yeah. Um, and, and it's just this idea of getting personal and knowing people's stories. And, and you're exactly right. I mean, and, and that's why I talk about the parades and Zorbas and, like, where are people already congregating in your community? And how can you as a church be there and just connect with them? Like, if you're at the Y and, and you're striking up conversations with the person you're running next mm -hmm. to or, you know, in aerobics class with – you get to now know where people are, are at. Um, I think, and I, but I, I love that story because I do think that that has so much to do with it. Like the fact that you sit down over coffee, you sit down over a meal, you sit down over, like in their spot, yep. not in your spot. Mm -hmm. um, and that will make a big difference. I, I think that's huge. Well, with the graph that I showed moving from 70% of Americans as members of church to 47%, yeah. that shift has to happen. People aren't just going to come through the nope. doors anymore. Even if you host a parenting event in your community at your church, you're going to get the people that go to your church. Yeah. You're not going to get the people in the community. So that's when I'm like, 
you need to partner with the school and host it at the school yeah. or host it at the local where like watering hole, like go to where the people are yep. and, and, and do it that way. And I would push just a little bit on, the, on that comment. I think if we, if we leave it to the pastor to be oh, the yeah, yeah, only yeah. one, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we For are sure. losing huge opportunity. We've talked at our church about how um, the members of our church are actually our frontline workers. Absolutely. Right, they're the frontline work. Yeah, yeah. We talked about that during the pandemic. Absolutely. You know, we are all front. You know, all the frontline. Pastor isn't the frontline worker. Pastor gets up on stage and does his thing. All of you are all the members of our church. They're the frontline workers. Yeah, they're absolutely. the ones who have. I hear what you're saying about that, but I'm going to push back a little bit myself. Yeah, please. And, and say that having a pastor come to our home made a bigger difference. Uh-huh. That makes sense. Uh-huh. Okay. Makes sense. Mix. And as, as we sat at our table talking here, we we talked about the perception that churches don't care. Mm-hmm. We think that's that's a real problem. Mm-hmm. Well, by going out to these homes, we demonstrate otherwise. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. And I would just I would just add to that that I think it's more than just the if the if Calvary relies on me for its future. This church is screwed, right? <laughs> right? It, it, it's a communal sort of thing. So I really appreciate it. Appreciate okay. it. Who else? One more question. All right. Our table, uh, we, we recognize you had mental health listed in, in lots of different areas. And so uh, we were looking to hear the, from Orange Orange's perspective. Yeah. Have you seen any or observed any churches uh, doing it right, like helping parents with mental health? Like, do you have any great examples that that this collective group could take back to their? Uh, uh, yeah, I I do think the churches that seem to be on the pulse of that topic specifically are willing to engage it on Sunday morning, and are willing to put resources behind it, even if it's, hey, if you're, and, and this is gonna depend on the, I, this isn't necessarily scalable, but like the, when, when we were part of a church and our kids were going through something, they connected us, they had the resource of, of they had a library of, of healthcare professionals that, that they trusted and they covered the first three sessions for our kids. Mm. Now, that's not necessarily scalable, but if you know psychologists in your church, could they offer to give the, the first consultant at a discounted rate for members of your church during that season where you, when you decide to, to do that? Um, not one church comes to mind, but there are several churches who have just decided, hey, we're going to take this month and everything we talk about is going to be in this area. Mm-hmm. And they bring in a speed, like they bring in a, we have um, Orange published a book called Scene recently that uh, deals with helping kids, na- helping your kids navigate mental health. Um, and those speakers, they bring those speakers to come and do a, a session. And I, I think it's just, You can't be one and done in an area like mental health. It has to be an ongoing conversation in the life of the church that you as a church are going to promote wellness. Mm -hmm. And so it might just be not talking about mental health, but it's talking about what does it mean to be healthy, whole human beings? And, and, you know, we, we last night we like, we're joking about the Enneagram, but like that really is a way that is a pathway towards wholeness and healing of which there could also be, I have a therapist and I have a psychiatrist and I have a doctor who I go to and see regularly who checks my weight and checks my temperatures and check, like all of that. Like it's that whole, because all of those things are important to parents more than their faith formation, more than their kids' faith formation, right? So if you address as a whole, like, oh my word, that church cares about my child as a whole person, that's gonna speak volumes because so many, like they don't think about the child as a whole person. They think about them, uh, their their eternity, mm-hmm. right? Not their present reality. Mm-hmm. Yet we are humans that God created for earth. And so we need to address that now, here and now. 
and again, what you seem to be insinuating is we bring that mainstream. That happens It has on to be Sunday in the full morning, life the of the church. It cannot just be this environment here, this environment here, this parent environment here. If you're speaking to mental health, every human being yeah. has a mental health issue. That yeah. is a Sunday morning topic that, has, that needs to be addressed. Yep. Right? Like that, it just has to be. How about a round of applause for Dan? And can I, I just want to say one more thing. Yeah, please. That, that I left out of my talk because the time, the clock was. was, I was like I said, just I know, ignore it. I know, but yeah. I, I, um, I will say this. You no longer have a dichotomy in your church. There's no longer an insider family and an outsider family. Mm-hmm. I, I, you're going to hear that language a lot when you, when you talk, when you study, you know, church and you follow people on Instagram that are church influence that there's insider and outsider, unchurched church. That is much more of a continuum now for families that you have families who have deconstructed their faith. They have not deconverted, but they don't think about faith in the terms that they used to think about their faith. It doesn't mean that they don't. It just means that the language has changed, the vocabulary has changed. And so it's not, I think in the life of the church, what we need to realize it's no longer either or. It truly is. There's this continuum of parent that exists that depending on their age, their generation, their experience with the church, where they came from, their background, they're going to have some sort of opinion about something. And, and so you're not just meeting one type of family anymore. Everything is nuanced. Yeah. Everything is nuanced. And so just remember that when you're even talking with families in your community that don't go to church, that does not mean they don't have any faith whatsoever. Mm-hmm. It just means they don't go to your church or a church. And so it just, just, so good. This last, that was just, sorry. That was so good. No, that sorry. was good. How about one more time? Awesome.